When I was 17, I had the extreme misfortune of breaking both of my legs at the same time. I had been playing football with some of my friends out behind my house in a wide open field. There was a barn that had been abandoned and was slowly rotting away. The way the barn was built, it was nestled right onto the side of the hill. So you could walk around the far end of the barn, climb up the hill, and walk onto the roof. I was being a bit of a dick during the game and I deliberately ran through what we had marked as out of bounds and ran up the hill and across the barn roof intending to leap down off of it and score a bogus touchdown. But due to the rain, the wooden roof beams were wet and soggy and when the wood gave out under my feet, I crashed downwards through the ceiling and landed hard on some old farming instruments including buckets, a set of horseshoes, and a spare tire for an old tractor. I'm actually pretty lucky that I didn't get impaled by a pitchfork or anything. To make a long story short, I broke both of my legs, dislocated my left arm, and had a concussion. I was rushed to the hospital and was discharged in a wheelchair, where I was forced to stay on the ground floor of my house. One night my parents and sister decided that they wanted to go see the new Lord of the Rings movie that was playing, and kind of without warning they said they were leaving. I found myself in the house alone. At first, I didn't mind. I had complete control of the TV and could play my video games as loud as I wanted to. But before long, I got frustrated. Most of my games were upstairs where I couldn't get them and couldn't reach the microwave or most of the higher cabinets from my wheelchair. So I was very limited on what I could do and I began to feel very bitter. I rolled myself into the dining room without turning on the lights and peeked out into the backyard, out across the field and into the barn. I'm not sure why I wanted to look back there. It was dark out, and there wasn't much to see. But I'm the type of guy who always has to be aware of his surroundings, in order for my mind to be at peace. I looked out at the stars for a few moments, and was about to roll myself backwards, and return to the kitchen, when I saw something. By the light of the moon, I saw two figures walk out of the barn, and make their way towards my house. I froze, too nervous to even let the curtain fall back in place. I made myself stare back towards the approaching figures. They weren't just walking, they were holding hands. I remember speaking out loud, are those kids? I felt most of the fear melt away and was replaced by rage. Who were these brats trespassing on our property at nine o'clock at night? We lived in a pretty secluded area and it would have taken quite a lot of walking through the woods in the dark to enter our backyard from that direction. That's when I made my first mistake. I opened the window and called out to them. Hey, what are you doing? Both figures immediately stopped in their tracks, still holding hands, but otherwise keeping completely still. Get out of our yard, I called out. There was perhaps five seconds of silence before one of them called out in a voice so calm it made all the terror and fear come rushing back. Can we come in? The voice sounded muffled. And at this point, my eyes had adjusted to the darkness. Now that I had a better look at them, I could tell that they weren't kids. I would say that they were probably teenagers, wearing white porcelain masks that had these sadistic painted smiles on them. My response died in my throat, and my hands began to shake. I slammed the window shut and wheeled myself fast back across the dining room and into the living room. I shut off the TV and lights, casting the house into darkness and rolled into the den. I got out of my wheelchair and crawled across the floor to the window and peeked out. They were both at the same spot, still holding hands, still staring right at the house. I watched them for a few more seconds and then one of them raised their hand and waved at me. Not in the general direction of the house, right at me. I ducked back and started freaking out and cursing. I hadn't turned on any lights. There was no way they could have seen half of my face peeking out at them from the distance in the dark. I had no idea what to do, and I didn't know if all the doors were locked, if the garage door was shut, or even when my family would be back home. I felt completely helpless, knowing that I didn't have the strength or ability to check every room in the house to make sure it was locked up tight. I went to the phone on my desk and frantically called my mom's phone but her cell was off. She was likely in the movie. Same thing with my dad. I thought about calling the cops, but I didn't know exactly what to tell them. 
Sure, there was two people trespassing on my property, but they hadn't threatened me or attempted to break in yet. I didn't know how to put into words the sense of urgency and danger I felt. I crawled back to my wheelchair and rolled myself through the darkness and into the hallway that separated the living room and kitchen. That's when I heard a knock at the door. And I heard a muffled voice ask, Can we come in? I turned away from the front door and made my way towards the stairs, intending to climb them on my hands and knees, crawl to my room, and lock myself in there. My front door had a strip of narrow windows turning vertically down along the doorframe, and when I was nearly at the stairs, a masked face appeared through one of the windows, and shortly after I heard giggling. <laughs> Upon making eye contact with the mask, the person crooked their head to the side. I froze like a deer in the headlights. All I could do was stare back. I remember it so perfectly. As I'm typing this, my hands are shaking. The mask disappeared from view. And that's when I noticed the deadbolt to the front door was unlocked. All anyone had to do was turn the knob and they could walk right in. Then there was a knock on the back door. And another small muffled voice. I could barely hear what it said because of the sound of my heart pounding in my ears. I shut my eyes and buried my face into my hands. I heard rattling coming from the back door. I'm not very religious, but in that moment, I prayed to whoever would listen. I'm not sure how long I sat there, crying, and waiting for one of the doors to open. But after what felt like 10 minutes, I looked up. There was no one peeking through the window at me. I slid out of my chair, crawled slowly to the stairs and into my room, where I shut the door and locked it. I'm not positive about this last part, but right before I shut the door, I glanced down in the dark hallway, and I thought I saw the shadowy outline of a dark figure, slowly tiptoeing up the stairs. I locked the door and proceeded to suffer through the longest night of my life. I never heard anything else from either inside the house or outside. My parents and sister arrived after 1 a.m., and by that time, my shirt was soaked through with sweat. They thought by the look on my face, I had suffered a stroke or something, and nearly called the ambulance for me. I never saw these masked people again. Of course, my parents didn't believe me. Why would they? There was no evidence that someone had broken in. It was just much easier for them to conclude that I just had a nightmare. My legs have since healed, and even though I still walk with a slight limp, there was otherwise no permanent damage. If I had to choose though, I would rather break both of my legs again, just to avoid the feeling of helplessness and terror that I felt that night when I looked into the hollow black eyes of that porcelain mask. Number 1 Back in the 1970s, my uncle used to spend a couple of weeks in his hunting cabin that was in the middle of nowhere up in Canada. Most of the time his trips were very relaxing and enjoyable. He would head back home afterwards feeling refreshed, having unplugged from society for a bit. He used to tell me that he had some of the best moments of his life sitting on his front step, watching as the stars faded from the sky and the dawn appear on the horizon. He was a real man of the earth, who enjoyed being one with nature. I'm surprised he never sold his condo and went full Amish. There was one year that nearly derailed his loner lifestyle and scared him so much he nearly sold the cabin and never went back. It's the most popular story circulated through my extended family, and the reason I always triple check my locks before going to bed. Now for some context, the cabin wasn't accessible by vehicle, and there was a small amount of hiking involved to reach it. It was about 400 square feet and was made up of a single room. There was no running water and no electricity. It was a wooden structure built upon a small stone foundation and because of this, there was about a 12 inch space between the ground and the floor of the cabin. There was a trap door by the fireplace where he would drop extra logs of firewood, so he wouldn't have to venture outside to collect more. The incident happened in October. It was extremely cold even by Canada standards. When he wasn't at the cabin, he had the front door locked with a padlock. But upon entering, the first thing he noticed was the hint of tobacco in the air. This confused him, because he didn't smoke and he hadn't been in the cabin since January. But he shrugged it off and got himself settled in. His first order of business was to get a fire going. He lit the lanterns, unpacked, pulled up his chair to the fire, 
and fell asleep. He woke up several times during the night, always in the state of panic, as if the chair was tipping over and he was falling. But the wind was roaring so hard outside, and the cabin walls were creaking so much, he shrugged it off as paranoia. He eventually left his chair and got into bed. He awoke one more time that night. When dawn was just beginning to peek through the window, he shot up in bed when he heard a loud roar of the wind, and through his haze of sleep, he thought he saw a figure outside the window. He scrambled out of bed, knocking over his chair, grabbed his hunting rifle and bolted across the room and flung open the front door. Fresh snow had fallen during the night, but there weren't any signs of footprints outside. He slammed his door shut, put down his rifle and muttered a few profanities as he righted his chair. He opened the trap door, grabbed a few more logs and put them on the fire, and then went back to bed. It should be noted that the lantern was burning low when he woke up, as was the fire, so there wasn't much light in the room. At about 9am, my uncle woke up to the sun shining brightly through the cabin windows. He got up, warmed some water for coffee by setting the kettle down on the shelf over the fire and then opened the front door. He said what he saw next nearly gave him a heart attack. There were footprints in the snow leading away from the cabin's front door. My uncle, being his normal impulsive self, threw on some clothes and boots, grabbed his rifle, and followed the footprints through the trees with his gun up, ready for confrontation. The footprints circled up the surrounding hills, and my uncle followed them to a spot where the entrance of the cabin was in plain sight. The intruder had clearly crouched for a long while, and the tracks made off at a good stride further into the woods. Based on the boot size of the footprints, the stranger was just as large as my strapping six foot three uncle, if not larger, and was clearly expecting my uncle to notice his tracks and come after him, or else he wouldn't have stopped to watch the cabin. He would have continued to run and make his escape. My uncle didn't want to fall into any kind of trap, so he fired a single shot into the air as a warning, and made his way back to the cabin. Once inside, he locked the door and opened the trap door by the fireplace. As he poked his head down, he scanned the area under the cabin with a flashlight and discovered one of his own blankets in a dirty tangled mess in the corner. There were a couple of empty soup cans he recognized from his own pantry, a single spoon, and several dozen small bones, most likely squirrels or rabbits. What my uncle thinks occurred was that somehow an intruder had broken into the cabin while my uncle was away and had been hiding under the floor the entire time he had been there the previous day. He came to the conclusion that the reason he kept being jolted awake the night before was because half of the chair had been resting on top of the trap door and whoever was below was trying to escape by lifting the hatch. Later on, when my uncle thought he saw a figure outside the window, he later realized that the figure had actually been inside and was heading for the door, but was interrupted and the man had likely leapt back down through the trap door when my uncle sprang to life and noisily knocked over his chair. The creepiest thing about all of this wasn't the fact that a complete stranger was hiding so close when my uncle thought he was alone. It was the fact he was hiding in the first place that really calls into question who he was and what his motives were. It was never confirmed how the man broke into the cabin, but was already under the floor when my uncle arrived, which tells me he was going to great lengths to make sure that he wasn't discovered. When he finally emerged from under the floor, he could have killed my uncle in his sleep, but he took the opportunity to run. It's possible that he simply decided that he didn't want to risk a struggle, but I think whoever he is, he was on the run, or at the very least, had something to hide. Earlier the same year in May, not very far away, a 17-year-old girl had gone missing while walking up the road to visit her cousins, and shortly after in August, a 21-year-old woman was found stabbed to death on the very same road the girl had disappeared on. I believe whoever was in my uncle's cabin could very well have had something to do with one or both of these unsolved crimes. My uncle never reported the incident to the police, and to the best of his knowledge, the intruder never returned. But it makes me wonder to this day, are we ever really alone when we think we are? Because if someone could be hiding under the floor in an isolated cabin during the winter, is it really impossible that there could be someone under your bed right now?
I used to live in a two-story house in Boise, Idaho. Both floors were meant to serve as a single bedroom apartment. I lived on the second floor, and the floor beneath me was vacant. I entered and exited the apartment through the back deck, and would walk down a wooden stairs to the driveway. There was a door in my living room that led downstairs to the second apartment, but it was deadbolted from my side. In turn, there was a door at the bottom of the stairs that was deadbolted from the other side. The entire time I lived on the second floor apartment, I never had anyone living underneath me. I would occasionally ask the landlord why that was, and he would always shrug and say that the building had a bad reputation. It had caught fire in the late 80s and two people had died downstairs. One extremely stormy evening, I was watching football in my living room when the power went out. I sighed and gathered some candles and a flashlight and decided that I might as well turn in early, even though it was only about 9 o'clock. I climbed into bed, but since I wasn't very tired, I spent a good hour tossing and turning. When 10 o'clock finally came around, I was about ready to get out of bed and just start making shadow puppets with my flashlight, just to pass the time, when I heard a door slam from somewhere in the house. I shot up in bed. I knew for a fact that I was alone in my apartment, and no one was supposed to be downstairs. The next second I heard heavy feet charging up the stairs from the downstairs apartment, and someone had began putting their way into the door that led into my living room. I leapt out of bed and grabbed my cell phone to call the cops. I locked myself in my bedroom and frantically told the operator that there was someone in the house trying to get into my apartment. There came a tremendous banging on the other side of the door, like someone was wielding a sledgehammer or an axe trying to break it down. The operator confirmed that she could hear what was going on and that the police were on their way. I stayed on the line for what felt like another hour, hysterically telling the operator who my parents were and to tell them I loved them in case I died. In retrospect, I probably should have just grabbed my keys and simply leapt out of my bedroom window and into the driveway and floored it out of there in my car. But I wasn't exactly thinking straight. I was convinced that I was about to die. When the police arrived, their wailing alarms drowned out the noise of the thunder and rain. They breached the house from the ground floor, and I heard them beneath me screaming, Police! And the noise on the staircase abruptly stopped. I heard more of the policemen on the back deck, knocking on the glass of the sliding door, and I ran out of my bedroom to let them in. Before I could even ask if they caught the intruder, they quickly rushed me out of the house and into the rain, claiming that the house was on fire. I waited in a patrol car in my pajamas, pretty damn wet and upset as the policemen ran in and out of the building with flashlights. After the fire truck had arrived, a police officer got into the car with me and offered me a towel, and then started to ask me questions about the intruder. I told him all that I knew, which wasn't much. The officer then explained that upon entering the house, the bottom door of the stairs was deadbolted shut, as was my door at the top of the stairs, and there was absolutely no damage to either door. Upon entering the house, the officers were overwhelmed by the smell of smoke and immediately called the fire department, assuming there were flames raging inside the walls. Despite the smell, the firemen concluded that there was no fire anywhere, and besides myself, there was absolutely no evidence that anyone had been in the house. The landlord arrived shortly after, as I sat in my living room in the dark, drinking whiskey right out of the bottle, muttering about how I wasn't crazy. I definitely heard the sound of someone attacking the door. He told me that the previous tenants who lived downstairs had been a single father and his disabled son. One night, the son had accidentally set a fire to the carpet in the living room, and the father and son were both trapped in the stairway, unable to open the door to the second floor, and had died of smoke inhalation. I moved out the following month. This happened when I was in the second grade of elementary school. One night, my parents had to leave to attend a wake, and they left me home alone to house sit. They told me that I was in charge of the house. I was to eat dinner, take a shower, and go to bed. They said that they would be back after midnight. I'd never been alone in the house before. It was really strange, but I wanted to enjoy this newfound freedom. So I was watching TV and feeling really powerful as I could choose whichever channel I wanted. 
We live in the rural countryside of Kyushu. Our neighbors are a couple of minutes away, so nights are usually very calm and quiet. I think it was about 8 or 9 o'clock. I had just finished watching a TV show, and the news came on. Boring, I thought. I guess it was time to take a shower and hit the hay. I was contemplating this massive decision while reading a manga comic laying down on the bed. Then, I heard a knock at the door. Oh, my parents came back early, I thought, as I went at the door. I looked through the frosted glass, and I saw the big shadow of a person there. My mom was only around four foot nine, so it couldn't have been her. Maybe it's my dad, I assumed. I called out. Hello? A deep male voice replied. Hi, little girl. Is your dad home? My dad was a bit of a drinker, and he often hung out with booze hounds. I thought that this might have been one of his pals or something, so I carelessly responded. No, he's not here. He's at a funeral. There was a short pause. And what about your mother? I didn't know what to say. I knew my mom hung out with her friends and they went drinking too, so maybe this guy knew both of them. But something told me not to reply. I felt a bit suspicious. What do I do? I thought that no matter what I would answer with, I might end up making another mistake or getting into trouble somehow. Mom's not home either. The voice persisted. This was so strange. We never usually had people coming to the house at this time of night. This wasn't right. There was something about his voice too. It didn't sound like the local accent. This wasn't good. I felt extremely anxious, and I couldn't bring myself to say anything in response. Are you alone in there, little girl? I began to cry silent tears while standing still and silent. Can't you open the door for me? I have something I have to give to your dad. I'm just here to drop it off. He said in a voice so extremely sickly. The kind of voice you hear when you're trying to coax someone into doing something. I mustered up enough strength to reply. Can you come back tomorrow? He didn't reply. He just started to violently turn the doorknob. I understood this man's intentions now and it felt like an arrow of ice went through my heart. My throat closed up and I couldn't breathe. I couldn't scream. Then came the sound of his fist, punching the frosted glass. Open it, he roared again and again. Please stop, I pleaded. It's so loud, I said. Then my brain kicked into gear, and I ran into the living room and grabbed the house phone. I didn't even know the number of the place where my parents were at. My parents had told me about people who would call the police when they don't need their help. Hoax calls. I was nervous, thinking I might get into trouble for one of these calls. While I was panicking about what to do, I heard the glass shatter in the hallway. He had breached the door. A horrible, thick arm shot through the hole. I remember he was wearing a jet black jumper. I screamed for help. I remember thinking this was more like a scene from a movie, not from real life. The arm was searching for the lock. While the arm was desperately probing for the lock, I heard another scream coming from outside. It was someone shouting my name. Someone shouting that they called the police. I wandered over to the door and I saw the owner of the new voice. I jumped for joy. It was the voice of the older lady who lived next door. She had heard all the commotion and came to see what was going on. As she shouted that she called the police, the man ran for it. I let her in. I was inconsolable. I just bawled my eyes out the whole night through. The police arrived about 30 minutes before my parents came back. When my parents did come back, they apologized again and again for leaving me by myself. In the end, we didn't know who the intruder was. My dad assumed it was a robbery attempt. Just as a side note, our town is located along the East China Sea in Kyushu, and there are a lot of suspicious ships around the ports. In addition, my hometown is famed for many unsolved missing person cases. We never found the man. 
but I often replay that moment in my head over and over. Thanks to that man, I have had countless sleepless nights. I don't like to think about what might have happened to me if my neighbor hadn't been there. We've become very close with our neighbors after this, and my parents never let me house it again. For almost a few years now, end of August 2019 to be exact, I had moved into an apartment in a different city because my mother who I lived with in my hometown passed away from cancer. I have moved here with my long-term boyfriend and one other roommate. We all absolutely love it here. The location is great. It's a 15-minute bike ride from my university and it's located at a square with a grocery store, drug store, lunch rooms and that kind of thing so we have pretty much everything we could possibly need to survive within walking distance. However, after just a month or two of living here, someone has started to ring my doorbell at exactly 11.05 p.m. semi-regularly. Sometimes every day, sometimes every other day, sometimes there's a week in between, and sometimes there's a couple of weeks in between. But it is always around 11.05 p.m., and every single time, I get no answer each time I ask through the intercom who it is, except for one time, but I will get to that in a bit. At first, I thought it was friends from one of the neighbors who accidentally rang the wrong doorbell, but after around the fourth time, I grew suspicious, and after more than those four times, I started noticing that it always happens at either exactly 11.05pm or a couple minutes earlier or later. My boyfriend and my roommate both work at bars so they work until very late and would usually only get home around 2 a.m. So each time it happened, I was always alone at home. It started to really freak me out after a while. When I first told them about it, they kind of shrugged it off and said it was probably a wrong dial, much like I thought at first. But when I told them that it has happened so many times, and sometimes even daily, they didn't really believe me and that I was just being paranoid and spooked. However, one night, when the doorbell rang again, I answered the intercom, asking who it was. I heard heavy breathing. I was thoroughly spooked at that moment. I was again home alone, and kept asking who they were and what they wanted. I couldn't make up from the breathing if it was a man or a woman, but I heard a strange mumbling or whispering, and then it was dead silent. They had appeared to have left. I put my apartment door on a double lock after that. I was so scared and spooked out. Thankfully, my roommate got home a little earlier that night, around 30 minutes after the doorbell rang. He could tell how upset I was. Now with the whole pandemic crisis, my roommate and boyfriend aren't able to work anymore. They now also witness the frequent door ringing at 11.05 p.m., so now they do believe me and agree that it's very odd and creepy. We have a balcony that looks down at where our apartment building's main front door is, but because there's a shop underneath us that always has the awning out, the view to the door is partially obscured. Every time our doorbell rang, me, my boyfriend, and roommate would go over to the balcony to see if we could see anyone, but we never could. I've also asked my neighbors from my apartment building if their doorbell gets rang so often but the ones that I asked all said it's never happened to them. So a few weeks ago, my roommate decided to do some investigating. He went outside our apartment building at 11 p.m., standing across the street. He pretended to have a smoke while keeping an eye on the door. He said he did see a man who looked kind of suspicious wandering around our apartment building. He slowed his pace down significantly as soon as he approached our door, but when he spotted my roommate looking at him, he quickly walked away. We aren't completely sure if that's the door ringer, but that was very, very suspicious. Our doorbell hasn't gone off at night since that day. I'm hoping that maybe it will stop now, but there is a possibility that it will continue again in a few weeks. <laughs>